Right, so if I say the word fingerprint, I guess that's the image that it comes up in your mind. But for over 100 years, we actually didn't know that fingerprints or crime scene fingerprints look like this. And what I'd like to share with you today is how we unlock the mechanism to give them voice because every fingerprint tells a story. But let's go back to when we thought that fingerprints looked like this. So, as you know, this is one of the most powerful means of biometric identification because every fingerprint is unique to the individual. And what forensic investigators do classically is to dust crime scene surfaces, trying to visualize these fingerprints. They will then lift them off the surface and then an image will be compared in a database looking for a match. However, this process has got a few shortcomings. So the CSI investigator needs to think really carefully about a few factors and choose the best enhancing technique. Uh, dusting is only one of them. Um, and even so, even if the technique is right, then you might have a situation like this where the fingerprint is actually smudged or distorted, so you, can, you can't actually see the rich pattern very well. Or you might have, in a best case scenario, a situation like this, where the rich pattern is really very clear, but the suspect has not been previously convicted, so his fingerprints are not going to be in the database. So this is kind of physical evidence, and when the data comparison and match fails, you're kind of stuck with this evidence. It's just put in a drawer where nothing else is done, nothing else is, is said. But wouldn't it be great to have a technology which not only will allow you to sort of see the rich pattern with more clarity, but also uh, ex extract more information, make them talk, and tell you about a story, tell you about clues um, about the suspect and about the, the crime that went on, uh, maybe the lifestyle of the criminal. And we thought that this technology, uh, we, we have this technology. It's called matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization mass spectrometry imaging, and I like to say that because it makes me sound really clever until people find out the truth. And so I had this, you know, we thought, oh, we got this great technology, lovely idea. So I pitched this to one of the research councils in UK. We thought, you know, we can apply this to a number of scenarios, you know, bioterrorism, and I've got a few data to back this up. So, great, so could you give me some money to do this? And in fact, guess what the council said? <laughs> great. So that's really the start I was hoping for. Um, anyway, well, I, I can't really show you the original of that because I, I have to tell the truth, and I had a kind of adverse reaction to this feedback, and I kind of burned the letter, so <laughs> set it on fire, so I can't show you that. Uh, anyhow, so what does this technique do? So it was invented in 1997 and classically was used to map biomolecules or molecules uh, in tissue sections from organs or biopsies. And we try to correlate the localization of those molecules with their function, their bi biological function. We thought, why don't we use this imaging technology to map molecules in fingerprints and actually come up with the ridge pattern, so reconstruct the, the, the ridge pattern in a chemical sort of way. So, what in, the, in its classical implementation, what we do is to cover the fingerprint with an organic acid that we call the matrix. Then via software, we define a raster of points over which a laser will fire automatically. And every time the laser fires, you got what's called a mass spectrum that you see up there. And that's just basically the collection of all the molecules that have been seen in that particular point. So you end up with an array of spectra. Each, each one of those spectrum will define the local molecular composition, our XY coordinates. And basically, every peak that you see there is a molecule. Okay, so what you can do now, hundreds of molecules, hundreds of potential images. So you can scroll through the different molecules that have been detected, and every molecule will bring up an image of the fingerprint, so exactly where it was distributed. So you can interrogate the software for molecules you're particularly interested in, <coughs> or just flick through, trying to find the best image. It will come up in a second, that, that one is good to be able to compare into um, and match into a database of suspects. Uh, the other thing that you can do is to try and stitch images for maximum reach coverage, or you can superimpose these hundreds of images to be able to see the reach detail with more clarity. 
something, that, and something else that we can do is to actually separate overlapping fingerprints. So this is a common occurrence at crime scenes, and it's very, very difficult to distinguish the different patterns, even with sophisticated algorithms. But with this technique, all we do is interrogate the software and say, show me the distribution of molecules that are characteristic for each fingerprint, and guarantee there will be some of them. You don't need to know them in advance. And there you go, you have the two fingerprints which are completely separated. I want to draw your attention on this overlapping area. So if that was the whole area that we could retrieve from crime, you know, from crime scene fingerprints, that would be completely impossible to resolve. And what I want to show you is the sensitivity of that, the technology. So for example, if we isolate one of the fingerprints and you just choose the best image that you can get, you can digitize that image and you can then compare this with a linked uh, <coughs> reference image that could be from a database or it could be if the suspect has just been arrested. And then what I've done, I've just concentrated on what it was the overlapping <coughs> area and I could manually pick up the uh, similarity points and it's about eight there and that's just enough to make a suspect identification. So this is about the power of this technology in, sort of, uh, in a physical way, but I did say that we can extract chemical information. So what we can do now is actually uh, detect a large number of different molecules from your own fingerprints. So we can detect things like peptides, proteins, fatty acids, small molecules, and these are actually known to be biomarkers. So a biomarker is an indicator of a biological state, uh, pharmacological response, uh, pathological processes, and the fact that they are differentially expressed in different biological states actually allow you to make some discrimination about the individuals. So you can say whether or not a subject is diseased or it will be diseased. Um, and you know, in a non-distant future, you might even be able to say things to, to distinguish, for example, between a meat eater and a vegetarian, or you know, to actually pick up a disease from fingerprints, or even tell the gender just looking and analyzing the fingerprints with this technology. And I just want to show you an example exactly on the gender bit. So we concentrated on the detection of peptides um, that all of us have in our sweat. And as soon as you touch a surface, you deposit a certain um, amount of peptides. So they will be present in your fingerprints. And we hypothesized that men and women have different levels and contents of these peptides. So what we did, we applied some stats and we trained a model to recognize the gender based on these biomolecules that we can see uh, in fingerprints. And so we trained the, module, the model which actually gets the gender right 75% of the time. When we apply, so this, this were people that we knew the gender of. When you apply this to people you don't know the gender of, and it was only eight cases that we had, then the, the, the prediction of accuracy is a bit lower. This kind of prediction wouldn't stand in court uh, as it is, but for the size of the study, believe me, this shows very good um, uh, prediction of accuracy, and there's still a few parameters to trick. We deposited a patent, and uh, this, this triggered a bigger study that we're hoping to make public next year. But this shows how powerful this technique is. So when you can't get a, ma a match, what else can a fingerprint tell you? Can it tell you whether or not the donor uh, was a woman or a man? Can it tell you whether the donor had a disease or um, if he smokes? Or in this case, we can tell you know, whether or not um, he's been in contact with some uh, forensically interesting substances. The most obvious example would be illicit substances. So I'm not gonna show that, but I will show something maybe you haven't thought of. So in cases of sexual assaults, if the rapist wears a condom, it will have to handle the condom, it's bound to touch some surfaces, the lubricants from the condom will transfer to his fingertips, to their fingerprints, and we can detect, we can map the rich detail, and we can also detect the condom lubricant, and we can even say which brand of condom they use. So obviously this is very important associative evidence. But we can answer all sorts of questions. So for example, the defense may come up with the following. Um, a reasonable doubt. What if the offender, or well the, you know, 
the alleged offender, actually didn't wear a condom, didn't commit the crime, and there was some condom lubricant on the surface as a result of previous sexual activity, so the plaintiff is actually trying to frame the, um, the defendant. Right, so as Magnus said yesterday, well, let's test it, let's see what happens. So we have a contam condom contaminated finger mark, which is deposited on a clean surface. And that's what we see. Because the condom lubricant will stick to the ridges, then you can see a clear fingerprint and the clear presence of the condom lubricant just on the ridges over there. But in the other case, if you have a, a surface that's been previously contaminated, so what we did was smearing the condom lubricant on the surface, and then somebody touches with a clean fingerprint, that's what you get. So the condom is everywhere, is in between the ridges, in the valleys, because it was pre-existing. So we can actually answer the question which came first, which again, valuable intelligence, valuable probative um, information. And I want to leave you with uh, somebody that Herb knows already, because I, I did say that in TEDx, but sort of um, proves the point I, wanna, I want to say. So, so far I've talked about substances or contact substances, um, endogenous molecules like peptides and things like that, but what happens to substances that you actually ingest? So, that's the story that I want to tell you about an Italian that has been living in England for four years, and as a result of that, has completely lost the ability to cope with, to cope with the uh, uh, Italian espresso coffee. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, but she drank some, you know, she made her own coffee, original, drank it, what you not do for science, and she took her own fingerprints at 10 minutes, and a photograph. And she could clearly see the peak of caffeine that has been unmetabolized, excreted through sweat, and then deposited through her own fingerprints. Okay, so that's clear, clear peak there. And she still looks reasonably sort of okay human being there, okay? 30 minutes, peak of caffeine, spikes, and she looks slightly more stressed. She starts to multitask. So I'm showing here the link between the microscopic and the macroscopic, okay? So it kind of proves the point that she wasn't really able to cope with coffee already at 30 minutes. What happens at one hour? She lost it completely, okay? <laughs> completely gone. P uh, caffeine peak spikes, and you can clearly see that from visualizing the caffeine peak in the fingerprints of, you know, Myself. Uh, and in case that was overlapped with a different donor's fingerprint, you can clearly distinguish the two uh, rich patterns. So, what's the moral of the story that I told you up to this point? First, virtually anything that you touch or ingest can be detected in fingerprints, um, and fingerprints can tell you that, okay? And we can, we can build up a story what went on before the crime was committed, what was the suspect lifestyle and things like that. The second thing that I want to share with you is when you get encouraging feedback like that, then, well, first of all, don't set anything on fire because I'm going to tell you that this is not well received. It is frowned upon, especially if you're at work and people from health and safety do not like it. So just, you know, as we said before, keep calm, ignore, Keep going, keep focused and driven, and I hope that I have convinced you that fingerprints can talk and will tell the truth. Thank you very much.